So I love this picture of a big oak tree that I found online. And I recently took the Quality Matters course. Um, and we had to describe how we thought uh, instructional design of online courses could be best represented. And to me, it's by developing a wonderful tree of knowledge. I started my career, my online career, in Kamloops. Uh, British Columbia with the Camel's Open Online course teaching K-3 to and I taught that by integrating technology um, into their regular courses and taught with their parents. Before that I've worked in face-to-face -face classes I guess we call them <laughs> um, and I started in Singapore at the International School and then I moved um, to Vancouver and I worked in an independent school and I've worked in Montreal I really moved around a lot, and I think that made it um, even more important when I became an online learner because it taught me. There we go. We it just is um, really important to keep those connections and figure out how to keep those connections and learn with others. So the other important thing is how I got involved in MOOCs, and just over a year ago, I was in a course called Change 11, and uh, the reason I was in the course was I was doing a job at the time where I was asked to develop online courses in China, and they were BC credited, so provincially credited online courses that we were delivering to students in China, and my principal at the time said, I want you to be as cutting edge and as crazy as you can possibly be. And so when I looked online and started Googling online and searching online to find the most cutting edge, bleeding edge, crazy thing you could do online, I heard about these MOOCs, and, <laughs> and thanks, Randy. <Freddie. laughs> and I started the MOOC, and it was a 36-week MOOC, I think, the longest MOOC ever. And they were coming to an end, and I just joined in. And I didn't know what Twitter was. I had no social media real experience. But I just jumped right in and found out I had to create my own blog. I had to catch up on Twitter. I had to do all these things. And Alec Kuroot was the facilitator facilitator that day and Alec Kuros, the K-12 learners, um, online learners is, in particular, is an incredibly motivating person and educator who totally rocks your world. He, he teaches you more than you could ever imagine and he was in right now like this in a webinar and it was the opportunity to speak to him and he talked back to me and that connection, that relationship, the fact that a teacher could give me that immediate feedback and I was part of something, part of something different, motivated me in that moment to do something different. So that summer I created Digifoot 12 with Steve Hargaden from Classroom 2.0. So it was last summer. And Lee talked to me a bit about the idea of massive open online courses. And do they have to be huge? And I had just over 300 participants, but only really 40 people went through the whole course. And it was my first attempt at creating a MOOC. And then I was hired with Alberta Distance Learning Center to create um, MOOCs or open courses for K-12 students um, in the past year. So what about you? In the chat box, I was wondering if you could tell me what's your name or your Twitter handle, what's your role as an educator, why are you here today, and what questions you may have so that I can ensure that I try to cover them. You can answer one or two. Randy's actually my mentor. That's pretty funny. <laughs> Randy. Anyone else want to tell me their name, their Twitter handle, what they do, or why they're here today? I can't read that one. The IT department. Wow. The original grant in the state, fantastic. And Lee's a professor, and she's excited to hear possibilities. Sixth grade teacher. 
Oh, so the person everyone goes to when they have questions. Developing, developing things, developing learning. Great. Thanks for sharing. Please type in your questions into the chat box, and if I don't see them because I keep moving the chat box, Lee can help me out. So, what is a MOOC? Some of you are in the middle of a MOOC right now. Oh, one more person. The next version of their destination log. Now I'm going to have to learn what the destination log is. What is a MOOC? A MOOC is technically a massive open online course, which was coined by Cormier and Brian Alexander a couple of years ago, actually. Um, and when I say that, I guess I'm being very Canadian and uh, by admitting it and promoting that Canadians started this whole trend. Um, we're going to get into that a bit as well. And the neat thing is that I've actually, in the last year, spoken with Brian Alexander and Dave Cormier at different times because when you start getting into the whole MOOC world, you start connecting with all these people and famous rock star names just uh, become learners like everyone else. The difference between CMOOC and XMOOC, oh, my three-year-old just wanted to come in. Sorry, that was what's going on. The difference between CMOOCs and XMOOCs, uh, CMOOCs, as you can see on this chart, I took this right from a website, you can get the link right at the bottom, is they're digital, they're social, they're intellectual, they're open to, and they have lots of topics where knowledge is, 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 you build on the knowledge with experience, you have debate, analysis, based on connectivism, and you build your own knowledge by sharing and discussing with others. The other thing that I thought was really interesting that they pointed out is that learners, you do have to have some prerequisites in digital skills. And I would totally agree with that now that, uh, now that I've got into the whole MOOC community. Um, XMOOCs, on the other hand, and XMOOCs, so some examples of XMOOCs would be Coursera or Audacity. CMOOCs are what you're doing right now, or um, ET MOOC, or Change 11 MOOC. Um, they are acquiring knowledge. They're based on basic topics. I don't see a big difference between them and regular online learning in that they're very traditional. Um, they are clearly structured and they're very closely seen classrooms and it is very easy to make a large audience because you don't have to have a lot of digital skills to figure them out. This is an, ex an image actually created by Dave Cormier on what a MOOC kind of looks like, the process of learning. So you start in the corner, you go and you'd write a blog and the blog might get um, created into a, a MOOC that's a YouTube video and then someone might write a paper about it and then someone might write a blog post on it and then something that's a little tweet for it, so the tweet gets sent out. The idea is knowledge is spread all over the place and the red and green lines represent that sometimes it'll come back to you and sometimes it'll go away again. So this is where Lee and I are going to experiment today. Today we're going to talk about how you can, or how open learning is seen or apparent in a K-12 learning environment today. Like, what is open learning in K-12? What you do is, I'm going to press this annotate box, and you get to write on the screen. And they'll actually click the um, pencil, and then it will send you a request, it says and then they can start annotating. And someone's annotating. My screen won't come up. Oh, I have a very odd screen, but that's okay. I'm seeing some circles. So <laughs> open learning is <laughs> Oh, that makes more sense. <laughs> Always interesting to see. <laughs> that kind of looks like the visual beforehand a bit <laughs> at the moment. Oh, now I don't know where it's going. I have a very gray, squishy image. Do you leave I do it? too. I do too. That's okay. what it looks like. I wonder if when we stop annotating, we'll be able to see what oh. others have done. 
I don't know that we will, but perhaps we will. This, we are both, you're not seeing anything. It's a bit choppy. Yeah, I'm getting that too, Ryan. And Lee and I are taking a big risk. Yes. <laughs> so we're Somebody thinking. drew a smiley face. Learning. Now, are those two heads? That's interesting. A big question mark. That's, that's actually three professor heads, but that's the students. So that's three students on a tree learning. The tree, three getting back to the tree of knowledge. I see. Okay. Yes. yes. Anyone else? Mark? Oh, we I see a big purple question mark. I do as well. And I see. Is that that might be Virgil? Virgil's quite the artist, and I saw he did. We're supposed well, to draw. <laughs> <laughs> to tell our our coworker. <laughs> yes. To, to represent to tell us anything about open learning. Oh, we got him. We figured it out. Anything that open learning in K to twelve. What could that represent? And I like that someone's just like traced the squiggle that we don't understand. <laughs> I think that really represents open learning. That's true. So when I have to represent open learning to a group of face-to-face -face teachers who had never done any virtual or online courses or had anything to do with it, um, we were all given Lego. Uh, and we were all given Lego packages all together. I'm going to let you keep drawing. I want you to draw and think about what does open learning mean. I, I'm fascinated by this. <laughs> so we were all given Lego packages, and we were told to create the future of education with this Lego package. What would that look like? So I looked at my Lego package, and the first thing I thought of was, I hate Lego. I'm not very creative. I can't do anything with this Lego. But then I thought, no, I can do something. So how can I make this Lego uh, represent connected learning? So I took my Lego and I split it up into pieces and I walked around the classroom and everybody else was creating those walls and those little buildings and those structures and the future of education and I passed out all my Lego and I introduced myself and I asked them their name just like Twitter or Facebook or any of the social media tools we use and a lot of people were looking at me like I was crazy just like this little network here. That's not crazy but they were looking at me as if I was crazy. And I had the biggest fear because we were told if we lost any of our Lego, they'd be really mad at us. So I was very scared that I would not get my Lego back at the end of the day, which is what a lot of us think about when we talk about open content and when we put things out in the open that we're not going to get anything for it. So we put things out but nobody returns anything. And so I was genuinely scared that I was going to lose my Lego. At the end of it, everyone had buildings, and I had nothing. I had a plastic bag with no Lego. And we talked about it, and we found out why I did what I did. And, and then everyone came back to me, and they gave me their Lego, and we introduced ourselves, and I made lots of connections, and then I had lots more people following me on Twitter. But I also ended up with more Lego, so other people must have given me more than I did to start off with. And that, I think, is the story that I want to share because it tells you a bit about what open learning is. And this, what we have created right now, we're going to stop. Let's see. Oh, no! Did it work? It's right? gone. It's gone. Well, that was what open learning was all about. And now it's gone, so we're going to keep going. <laughs> learning. Changing your behavior based on experience. So what we just experienced, giving you the opportunity to think about doing something differently, taking a risk. The open classroom model at the beginning of the year, I searched through research, I went to the open education conference, I talked to cutting edge um, open uh, learning researchers in their field like David Wiley I got to speak to and George Siemens and um, some people from the open university. Based on what I could assess and and, and the fact that I took courses, I took MOOC courses, there's three different kind of um, stages to open learning in K-12. to The first stage, if you aren't 13, you are, it is illegal for you to, to use social media tools and to integrate in an open environment by yourself. And that, that's just the way it is. 
So the way to deal with that is to um, create a walled garden, and you could do things like the teacher uses their Twitter account to um, encourage learning within the classroom or Skype or create Edmodo um, courses where everything's walled and closed or even using some of our LMS systems to give students an idea of what it could be like or what social media could be like or what tools they could use in the future. By age 13 or 14, it said that uh, statistically that over 78% of students are using social media in some form or open access to learning in some form. So we need to make some kind of transition between um, the walled garden and what we're getting to, which is complete autonomous open learning. So the transition period is extremely important. This would be middle school time, and the teachers there, it, Lee, sorry, where is it still illegal technically, when you're 13 or 14? I got confused by that, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I, I think oh. uh, Bar that was Barbara's question. Barbara, do you want to, to ask? Oh, question? sorry, I didn't. Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I was just thinking about sixth graders and uh, the blogging that we're doing, and that isn't quite walled because they're out, but I kind of got around that with having pr parental permission. And so when I saw the word illegal, it made me concerned. So is that not legal, what I'm doing? The illegal part comes from social media joining Twitter or Facebook, anything that a student has to sign up for without their parent, like if their parents don't know what or know, and blogging would not be illegal. It would be legal because usually you're using, um, for two reasons. One, you're using, it, it's gone through your school district usually, or, yeah, and laws change from state to state, but you're using a tool, and when it doesn't, <laughs> well, it's actually a technicality, but if no one is, if, it's, if you've gone through your parents and you have permission, then actually it's legal anywhere that I know of, as, as long as you have the parent, except in Florida and Texas where they have extremely tight laws. Um, but it, it, what I'm getting at is exactly what you're doing is blogging, you're, you're putting something out in the open, but you're restricting the access and the feedback and that interaction piece, so you're creating that transition period between the two. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but you're not actually doing anything illegal. Okay. <laughs> and oh, then, yeah. yes, that. My main goal is to stay out of the news. So Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Although you are watching what they're doing and the parents are watching what they're doing. So that's exactly what you want to be doing, that transition period. And the autonomous open learning is where the students are already doing it by themselves and YouTube and other things, but you are encouraging them to consider open courses like you're doing, we're doing right now. And this is, well, it would be a very um, gifted 14-year-old. I would assume it's more 15, 16-year-old and above, and that's what I've been working on as well. But it's all dependent on their skills and abilities. So this was the model that I started with at the beginning of the year. Now, when I thought about exemplary teaching and where I was getting this all from, I took this from the MOOCs I was in, and I looked at some amazing K-6 teachers who were using Skype. Oh, we have some kind of, there we go. We, using Skype or Twitter in their classroom and doing some amazing things with social media tools. And this is what they were doing. They were creating free and open access to resources. They were willing to collaborate with people around the world. They were op they used open mobile access. They could see artifacts on a variety of different platforms. There was a transparent tone and means of communication. Everything was in the open, so you couldn't hide what you said. If you wrote a comment, then since someone replied to it, then everybody could see. They gave credit to their sources. They were open to feedback. They were approachable. This is huge in open learning. You have to be approachable and able to connect with people. And they were focused on their learning and the students' learning. I took the combination of those two and created this list of open learning characteristics of K-12. So this is what I was looking for. Digital literacy integration, it had to be competency-based. And uh, competency-based in Canada, in particular, is a bit different than in the United States. So I just want to add that bit. Um, Competency-based, what I'm referring to, isn't definitely necessarily mastery of skills. It's developing 
a skill uh, based on, for example, ethical citizenship, and you describe evidence of how you were an ethical citizen. So that's what I'm referring to when I describe competency-based assessment. Um, Problem-based and inquiry-based learning is promoted. Collaboration, networks, open access, open platforms, similar things, transparent communication. Feedback loop, which I think is huge because in online learning, in my experience, if you don't give immediate feedback or feedback as soon as possible, that engagement piece is lost. But the most important part is the emphasis on learning for all, which means interdisciplinary, intergenerational, and international, if you can. And intergenerational means everyone's learning together. So from that model, the learning design piece is connect, which refers to what uh, you were talking about earlier, starting with blogs. Actually, you've gone one step further. It refers to looking at other people's blogs, being that lurker, joining communities, but not actually engaging or interacting in any way, just literally starting the process. The second part is collaborate. So that's what you're doing with your blogs. You're sending out that first interaction to the world because the blog can be read by other people. It could also mean you actually reply to a blog or reply to a YouTube video or um, connect with another class. The two of you work together. And finally, create, which is the hardest thing to get to, um, is when you actually design and create something in an online space with other people around the world. And I tried to use this model in what we were doing this year. The first course that I offered was BIFA 12, and that was a badged course, and you can see it up at the top of the page. Um, <coughs> excuse me, BIFA 12 was uh, named after Beyond Facebook. I actually did a focus group of students and asked them what they would want to learn about, and they said they wanted to learn about um, anything beyond Facebook, anything but Facebook. Then I did uh, SPEAT, which was educators, um, an educator-based MOOC. And finally, I did Student Hack Ed, which is a student-run MOOC. And I'm just checking. I'm talking so fast. I'm just checking in the chat box. And now I'll go in a bit more detail on each of them. So the picture that you're seeing now is based on the competencies and the evidence of learning from all the different students in the course. The course was over three days, and Lee and I talked about how you would uh, create a course for uh, high school students. And I, what I thought would work most is something short and sweet, um, and it certainly proved to be the case. So students on the first day were asked to meet each other in an online, um, they met in Canvas infrastructure, and then they were asked to go to a Google Doc where they met for the first time, and they were asked to create a blog about anything. There could be about anything, and they could use any blog that they wanted. There were no restrictions on it. And then they had another day to work on that together, and then on the third day, they were asked to send it out to the world. So the course was three days, and I remember on the first day, we sat there, and we had 21 facilitators watching over, um, and, and they were split up between the three groups. And you could see them in the Google Doc in the corner watching, because we had lots of educators who wanted to do it, but not a lot of kids in the first aspect. So we only had sorry, seven kids, 21 educators. <laughs> and some of the educators started to participate and became learners with the process, but you could see that the students really wanted to create groups by themselves and do their own thing. So you could see the educators pulled back. But we waited and waited that fir those first few hours and waited and watched in the Google Doc, and, and literally you could see the little people up on the right-hand side, you know, little colors. Nothing. The kids didn't put anything in there. There was nothing. There was nothing. And so I thought the whole thing had bombed and the whole thing was over. And then at about 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night, within the three different Google Docs, they started to put links, and they started to put little bits of information. And one of the links was to an Etherpad um, discussion and chat, and the students had chosen to meet in Etherpad, and you could see the whole discussion from the very beginning all the way to the end of the night. It showed who led the discussion, who created, who came up with the ideas, which direction the conversation went. And 
really it was one of those first time moments as a teacher that I could see everything that they talked about and learned about. And even in a face-to-face -face classroom when you're working in group work and working together, you can't walk around and hear everything that they're talking about all the time and there's no data to actually support it. I could go in and tell you exactly for the first time, evidence of learning, who was doing what and why. And the kids could go back and use that, which is what they did when they did their own assessment at the end. They took information from this etherpad and they put it into their um, own assessment of how they learned and what they did within this project. So that's, so by the end of the night, we had all these links and blogs and I learned that it didn't matter how much scaffolding I did or how much direction I gave to use specific tools. The kids went off and did their own thing anyway. And uh, that's what they're doing. That's how they're learning. That's where they're learning. And we have to encourage it. And I couldn't watch them every moment, but I could ask them to come back and share. And boy, what a wonderful opportunity it was because they did share everything with me. And I do have all of that in a, a live binder as well that I can, can share with you. The Marina, only thing. Marina. Oh, yeah. I'm just, I was just going to, I wanted to just interrupt for a second just to ask, um, you mentioned earlier that prerequisite knowledge, prerequisite technology knowledge was important for interaction yeah. at this level. And so uh, what was the formal um, technology introduction that they had had? I'm assuming it wasn't in this application, but this is something that they used anyway otherwise outside of the school environment or they well because the the credit course that I chosen was based on an LMS I had to use canvas infrastructure and I couldn't figure out a way to get them to sign their permission forms without it like right. they're literally their FOIP permission form but no they would never used it before and they said that at the end that that was the hardest part of this whole thing using an LMS okay. they the activity and the learning was not an issue creating the blog yeah talking, getting together. One of the other groups got together. They just connected through Twitter um, and, and they did FaceTime and they did their own, everyone did it differently and in their own way. Um, but none of them used really the LMS and the tools. That was me imposing it on them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then and I wonder how you might, be, if you're going to talk about this later, just tell me, I wonder how you assess something like that. Well, um, the way we... Yeah, so we gave them a rubric so they knew what they needed within their blog, and it was either yes or no. Yes. Like it's either there or it's not there. So I could make it out of 10, and really you get 10 out of 10 or 9 out of 10, and it's either there or it's not there. The interesting piece was, so the point is everyone's going to do well. <laughs> They're really honest, which is great. You either do it or you don't do it. This piece, though, the one that we're looking at, the blog part, was, where they wrote what they learned. And all I did was I took the Alberta Inspiring Ed framework and they had all these competencies on it that were things like ethical citizenship, uh, digital citizenship, entrepreneurship. <laughs> <laughs> all these things. And I said, tell me how you demonstrated this. And I explained, you know, what it was, the competency was. I expected them maybe to choose two or three. They chose to write essays, really. And again, that's in the live but it was it was chunks, little paragraphs within this chart. I've never seen anyone write so much. And so then I thought about from a report card point of view, they basically wrote everything. Like I would never have to write another report card. They did it all. Like they really did. And if you needed to transition this to a core subject, because I was experimenting and using, you know, um, something that wasn't core, you would be able to go back and look at what they'd written and really understand what they're not getting. Like it was very clear what they understood and what they didn't understand because you were asking them what they learned and why. Fascinating from an assessment point of view, I have to admit. Again, it's all you either get it or you don't get it. That is very clear. So that's the competency. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you for including this live binder. That will be very fun to look at. I wonder if anybody would like to jump in with any questions at this point. Oh, that's good. I've overwhelmed Randy. He wrote that. <laughs> I'd like to overwhelm you, Randy. It was Very overwhelming. Good. Yeah. Very it, good. It, it was absolutely overwhelming and totally scary because it, you didn't know what 
was going to happen. Now, the difference between this being a MOOC and not online coursework work is online coursework in, in, at ABCLC, in Alberta Distance Learning Center, or in Kamloops, or anywhere else I've ever learned, there is no integration of social media, or there's no openness to it in that there's no open educational resources, there's no feedback by students or others in an interactive and open way. Um, there's no opportunity to get feedback from the world and connect with other people outside your limited um, learning management system or your course. So that's what makes the big difference is that instead of just connecting with your group of learners, you're able to connect with anyone who's passionate about what you're interested in. I would say that's the big difference, in my opinion, because I'm still experimenting. <laughs> so, so the first one of the big learnings or big findings that happened was because the, the end of that story was the very last day when we're about to all meet in Collaborate, so again I'm teaching a Blackboard Collaborate, teach them a new tool. Um, sorry, but any joinable by anyone in the open? Yeah, Ryan, anyone, anyone could join in this, um, but in a K-12 environment because of safety concerns. Uh, you have to make sure that you do know who the, the student is. And I would say that's the biggest difference between open learning in above K-12 to and below. I thought I could do it totally in the open, but I think that would be um, ethically wrong of me at this point to do as an educator. So I think that's the difference in open learning from K-12 to and above. You, you have to know who the student is. Um, on, and this is why. So on the very last day, we were... Uh, about to meet and collaborate, and I'm looking at their blogs, and one of the students had put up a YouTube video that she'd also just learned how to make, and it was all about her suicide attempt. And it went into great detail about how she felt, and why she did it, and how her parents felt, and how her sister felt, and how the doctors felt. And right at the end of it, she said, um, well, I don't think suicide's a good idea. It's okay if you do it. And so immediately, I had to contact her. Uh, the mommy bear jumps out of you, and it's not really an educator thing anymore. You instantly want to get that child some help, and you want to get them support. And if you can rest assured that I immediately got her support. I spoke to her principal. I spoke to her mother, actually, <laughs> over the phone, and she got the help that she needed. And we asked her to take it down, and we asked her to take it down for two reasons. One, it was the personal information that she was revealing. Two, that it was... Um, giving permission or possibly hurting others um, by her actions. So is that learning or is that hurting? So that's what we talked about. And I guess three was also the idea of digital citizenship and digital identity and something that she put there when she was 15 which could have uh, ramifications in the future. And it was that reason and nothing else that she chose to take it down finally. The good thing was that they did group blogs so technically, another group member could take it down, and that is another lesson to learn. Do you want to do independent blogs when you don't know all these kids, or do you want to do group blogs? So another finding in this is you have to build relationships with these kids beforehand, before you're ready to go totally in the open like I did. So I wouldn't necessarily go completely open that way again. I, in the future, we've decided we will work with teachers in the schools and face-to-face -face environments, or if they're only online learners, they'll come and develop that relationship with me the week before so we can talk about things like digital identity and, um, and citizenship. The other thing I learned was I only had seven people, and while Lee and I do agree you don't need lots of people to have a MOOC, you do need people. So the second MOOC attempt was um, trying to connect with educators. And so using SEAT, which, oh, Randy might have to help me on this one, computer educators, uh, anyway, it's in British Columbia. I can't remember what SEAT stands for. But they offer free open online course webinars, and they, they're weekly throughout the year. And they asked me to come and create a course. And I said I would if I could do it completely in the open. So I didn't want to use an LMS because that was one of the biggest problems with the first course. Um, and I wanted to really talk to the teachers about how to consider open and online learning. Thank you. Community expertise and educational technology. So you can see on the right-hand side here, the syllabus is connect 
collaborate, create. So we went through that learning design again, and I went into it in more detail. And we started with 30 people, which is usually about average by seat. And by the end of it, we had about, oh, the other thing is we also had a Google community. So we decided to integrate Google communities into this one. Um, and at the first, we started with about 30 or 40 people. So this, Ryan, is all in the open. There's no, anyone was allowed to join. Yeah, seats is open to everyone. With the Google community, we started with 30, 40. We ended the week with about 150 to 200 people. And I just checked yesterday, and the community is still going, and it's just over 500 people. What really excited me about that is that people still engage and talk in this community. It's people who will come in and lurk, or they actually uh, post something, or they don't. But that idea of community is sustained, and it kept going. So finally, the third attempt at a MOOC in an open online world, I decided, well, maybe the students could do something. Maybe the students could lead. And what would that look like? So again, I said, I need to watch this. I need to be careful. I need to have those relationships developed ahead of time. So what am I going to do? And I decided to work with Don Wetrick and the Franklin Community High School. So he had already developed his um, innovation class. He had the relationships with the students. So I came in and described what a MOOC could look like or might look like. And they decided to create student hack ed. So they created a wiki and they created a Google community. I kind of swayed them along that way because we were talking about how to keep it completely in the open and it was open to everyone. And they decided the course structure would be one week of how to make a video because that's what they're passionate about is video creation. And the second week, was how to make a video about how to teach the world something as a student or a learner. Um, we had more success with this, and it was really interesting. But uh, 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 Lee, from an instructional design point of view, it certainly taught me that the instructional design is much more important than I necessarily thought, because the students just wanted to start it without any platform or digital base and we had to sway them on it uh, and encourage them to have a wiki or a spot to get to our platform. Now the the seat is, yeah, it's just, we, we can get you a link on it. It's um, anyone can join. And I know that they'll have different things for next year. Student, um, student Hackhead has actually led the, the Google community had people internationally in it. They had people from Australia and from Israel, and they were all students. And every person that went into that group, this was the only closed part to it, I guess you could say, right? Any person that wanted to join the group, I was able to, I did massive Google searches on all of them. And if they weren't willing to identify themselves or send me an email from where they worked or whatever, then they weren't allowed in the community. And there was only one person that didn't and do that. And it was fascinating to see who these adults were who wanted to join the community. A lot of them were from um, major educational corporations, and they're just watching to see what was going on. Um, but then they had to own up to it, which was interesting. So after this year, what have I learned based on all those characteristics? But first, I'll go into any of any questions, because they can read as we go. We're really into seat, the seat thing. Any questions? I'm talking, talking, talking. Not at this point, Melissa. Hey. Ryan seems to have something that he might be about to ask. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Anticipating the question. You have a seat BC t shirt. Wow, Randy. <laughs> oh, Ryan's thinking. Okay. <laughs> okay. You're, he's that old. Yeah, you are in very old. So, <laughs> the, <laughs> the findings this year. Yeah, yeah, he's the old. Yeah, he's old <laughs> um, building of relationships, community, uh, connections, networks are the key to developing open learning opportunities in K-12. Course design is much more important than I thought. Course design meaning the practical framework 
but the instructional piece, how it is delivered, wasn't as important as I thought. Um, it doesn't mean that it's not there and I'm not watching it and facilitating a process. It's about letting the students lead the process and swaying them if they go too off course and open in the K to 12. I would say in MOOCs in the big world, people go off and do whatever they want. There's a lot more scaffolding and swaying in, in, in the K to 12 little guys because you're trying to prepare them for the big world as well. The idea is preparing them. Moshi Monsters Wow Second Life. Oh, um, immersive environments or virtual worlds? Is that what you're thinking? Moshi Monsters. I think, is he thinking virtual worlds? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, that's funny because at the end of the year, because I was trying to focus on interactive and collaborative environments, I spent the end of the year working with First Nations students in an immersive environment a virtual world to try to see how that would work. Um, it was called Atlantis Remixed and it was fascinating, but it was um, it was very closed because they couldn't get out. <laughs> Nobody could get in, but they couldn't get out. And so I found that very difficult, Ryan, so that it wasn't open. The open parts are almost too open in Second Life and um, other ones. And so that's why I haven't found uh, uh, compromise yet. I guess that transition piece that I'm talking about, the transition between the walled garden and the open world, haven't really seen that in the virtual world yet. Yes. Well, in, in, in Second Life shut down the teen grid too, so Is really it? there's, yeah, there's nowhere for a teen to participate in Second Life any longer. No, I know Unity is creating something, but again, it's still walls. So, um, yeah. But, yes, that is about engaged student engagement and interaction and collaboration. Absolutely, same kind of ideas. It's just how they, who they interact with, I guess is the key thing. Um, encourage learners to take the lead and communicate their learning. Just get them to tell you how they're learning, how they're, what they're doing. <laughs> I'm scared of Second Life. Yeah, I'm scared of Second Life too. The only time I was there, people got mad at me and I didn't know what I was doing, so. <laughs> I don't know why they were mad at me. <laughs> George is asking about um, features or devices that you used to build relationships. Oh. That's a question I have too. So, but you might also be about to address this. So, <laughs> no, no, not really. The the way that the relationships were built were actually one on one connections. So, um, spending time, getting to know them um, personally, but not overstepping your boundaries, so figuring out what they're interested in. And the best thing was when they were able to create their own blogs and you let them and you encourage them to create their own blogs, they created blogs about um, One Direction or jokes or whatever it is that interested them. So you had something to talk about that interested them. That's how, that's another way to develop those relationships is just letting them create authentic learning opportunities and the content because then it, it, it means something to them. And again, I'm trying to figure out how to do that in core subjects as well, but maybe maybe we don't need to do that necessarily, or maybe you do this in two week chunks as well in core subjects, but always being able to um, make it authentic to the learner in order to develop those relationships, especially in online environments. But a lot of communication, a lot of talking, a lot of time, so again, from a massive point of view, is that sustainable? Is that going to work? Uh, the only way that'll work is if you encourage the students to engage with each other as well. And that really helps when the students support each other and help each other and compare their feelings and emotions. It was like a giant sharing circle. Um, and they were doing it in an open environment, which was fantastic. <laughs> um, any other? Did you, use, did you use Twitter as one of the anchors for conversation or have you ever used Twitter as a way for students to build relationships with each other and with you? I tried that, but uh, for me, because that's what I use Twitter, but the students weren't into Twitter. Yeah. So yeah. it just didn't work for them. I Now it seems that Twitter is more useful. So that's going back to what they want to use. Yeah. And um, I think the hardest part for me was becoming familiar with the new tool based on what they wanted to use. <laughs> So it's not forcing 
or it's never forcing when you're a teacher, but it's not using what you're comfortable with. It's using what the kids okay. are comfortable with. Yeah. Yes, Randy, way too much chat. Like literally they love chatting the best. So if I could have done, yeah. The hardest thing for them was writing out their competencies because then they had to use full sentences. But up to, like if you let them chat, you would have unending amounts of data. And they love the Blackboard Collaborator, our little like chat right now. They just found that fascinating because it's like a little um, a phone for them, right? So they love that. Exciting. But they didn't get Twitter, so you know. I, um, the you have to model and practice open learning yourself. So I was out there tweeting and doing all sorts of stuff. Uh, you have a lead facilitator and key facilitators, or whatever you want to call them, wing men. That that means having someone that knows the student already or has a relationship with them already. And Ryan, as you pointed out already, that means it's not totally open. <laughs> <laughs> somebody knows somebody, but I think um, that's part of this, that somebody does need to know somebody, especially when we're dealing with kids under 18. And I think, I would even say this is a criticism of over 18, a student facilitator, sorry, we actually had student facilitators as well, very good point, um, Randy, we did, but we didn't have enough all the time, but we did in the third student hack ed, we had three student facilitators that went out. Oh, Ryan gets it. That's awesome. Mostly open course. Yes, that's what it is. Mostly open. Uh, it's, it's open in a digital sense, but yeah, it's not open to an anonymity. I guess that's it. Um, we need to know who you are for safety reasons. Blended learning, which means an integration of online and face-to-face. -face. Integration of open educational resources. And, and you integrate open leadership by doing it yourself, modeling it, and open learning practice, which I'm now, now that's what I'm working on. What does it mean to be an open learner, or what does it mean to practice in the open? Oh, I'm just trying to read this. I was thinking of Kayla. Yeah, other, you could bring other fourth graders into the project. Yeah, you can still do that. I, yeah, but you're right. If you have an individual, you might totally agree. You might have a problem for safety reasons. You need to know. Although, when we were planning the student hack ed, so the teacher and I were planning it, we, we were using Google Hangouts to plan it, and we were just learning about Google Hangouts, so we made it public, and we certainly learned you never do that. Never, <laughs> ever make a Google Hangout public. Don't do it. And the first three people that dropped in, well, we just, it was not good. And then the third, or the fourth person that dropped in was a 12-year-old kid. And we said, you know, I'm sorry, but you've got to go. From an illegal point of view, we can't have a conversation with you. <laughs> it was, and we wanted to learn from him and learn with him, but we had to leave. And I thought, wow, this is why we're doing it. If 12-year-olds are popping into public Google Hangouts. And we asked him, like, how did you find us? You know, why are you here? And he's like, well, I go into them all the time and I discover people and really only one person sends something inappropriate, but otherwise it's pretty okay. And we just said, we gotta, like, we'd love to talk to you, but we gotta go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, consider digital comfort zones. So what I mean by that is the digital skills, the, the openness that some people wanna do, how connected do they wanna be, how closed do they wanna be. Um, technology frightens them, technology doesn't frighten them. You had that the digital comfort zone piece is huge, and we don't we sometimes expect that everybody should be able to do this if they're a kid, because don't they all do it? And that's not the way it works at all. But also be considered of your own digital comfort zone because I wanted them all to go in Google Docs, and none of them wanted to go in Google Docs. So it's for the teacher point of view, an student point of view, student choice, multi access. Create and design opportunities that create multi-access, as many opportunities as possible, um, because none of the students use the same tools. I was asked that. Did they all use them? And it was the first time that there were only seven people that came into the collaborate um, session at the end, and two of them came in on iPads, and no one in my life had ever come in on an iPad before, and two come in in that moment, is because that's what they're familiar with. Um, so that was really exciting. Be flexible and prepared to follow and encourage the learners. So you do a lot of following wherever they go. And the short synchronous projects with a lot of asynchronous activities, 
And Alec Curls actually reminded me on the last one, daily summaries. Every day I wrote up great things that happened that day, great experiences in every single one. So the kids loved it because they loved hearing about what wonderful people they are. Um, the educators in the speech open courses, they loved it because then they got to find out things that they might have missed or, or seen. And I would say that as the facilitator, that took me the longest amount of time. Um, so that relationship piece again, then they feel like I'm developing a relationship with them or I know them because I'm reading their work, I'm commenting. So even if I don't always comment on their blog, I might tell people to go see their blog. It was a lot harder in the educators group when there were like 100 people in it than it was in the sevens, obviously. And in the student high head, it was quite difficult because they were all over the place. So, but daily summaries, huge. The future directions, UE13 is a group of connected educators from around the world, and every month they're offering free PD, and you follow along. Bye, Francis, thanks for coming. You follow along throughout the year, so every month you're a different topic, and everybody can help each other out and do the PD together. That's happening. Student Hack Ed will continue. We just don't know what's happening. Uh, the students have decided that they're going to try it again and do some other projects. MOOCCon is helping, or er, happening. And it's 24 hours of students. Every hour, a different student uh, and group of students leads the discussion. And it's going to be all over the world in 24 hours. And that's led by Carolyn Durley. And I'm working on developing a two-week MOOC that surrounds MOOCCon. So the first week is going to be about leadership skills and how to develop your leadership skills. We're all going to go to MOOCCon and we're going to participate. And the second week is going to be about how to change the world and working together in groups on uh, making a difference. Okay, I've talked enough. Anything, any questions? And Barbara did have a question. Um, how do we encourage students to join these opportunities if they have limited access to technology? Yeah. Maybe they only have access at school. So that's where the teacher is hugely important and using their Twitter feeds, even with one computer, you can make a difference and connect with the world. I only had one computer in my class. It wasn't my classroom. It was my daughter's kindergarten classroom. And we just connected in Skype on the computer, and we'd all sit around the computer. We didn't have the smart board. We didn't have anything else. Um, and it just you just appreciate it a little bit more when you don't have all these opportunities. And then you integrate it into projects and that they can do at school, absolutely. But you're right, you're definitely limited when they can't go home and, and do things. I know with the virtual reality world that I was in, as soon as the students left, they had no access to computers either. So the idea that they go home and actually get some work done that other kids were doing never happened. They only do things in school. But as opposed to all the MOOCs where all the work was done outside of the school, but it was, you could get it done any time during the day, so you probably, in those cases, need to get it done um, during the day and not at night. So yes, you're definitely affected by the digital divide. I wonder if anybody else has questions. And George was with me at the beginning, so he definitely got an overview of what happened over the last year. <laughs> Yeah, Ryan, that, yeah, very good point about high speed access. I'm glad you stole a few slides, Randy. I steal slides from you all the time. Any other questions? Uh, Ryan and, and Barbara, it is true that the internet is, is different, you know, in, in rural Alaska. Um, there are some places, you know, students can go, the schools, the library, um, but I think just building that into our design um, it is important. And so it's possible to connect students, just have to connect them in, in ways that, that they can connect. We wouldn't want to do Google Hangouts <laughs> because we know they wouldn't be able to connect that way. Uh, and yeah, I think it's just a matter of building it into our design. And that's why it's important to think all these things through at the beginning as much as we can. So. Well, yeah, you do your best. And 
And like for me, LMSs are very restrictive, uh, learning management systems like, like D2L, but on the other hand, they can be very, um, a, a great opportunity if that's the only thing you can get into. So the, a huge learning was it's not about me, it's about the kids and how they learn best. So you have to think about that. Well, that's good, Ryan. That sounds like a, uh, a grant you need to write. Oh wow, Matthew, that's depressing. So yeah, we just we just need to be aware, and so we'll just try things out and see what we can what we can what we can work with. But Farina, you have given us so many great ideas, so much food for thought. Thank you so much for joining us today. Randy is applauding you. And Thank I'm you. Applauding. Yes, yes, this was wonderful. And uh, does, does anybody have any uh, any questions before we we say goodbye? Thanks, Barbara. Nice to meet you too, Ryan. We have developed a relationship. I feel like I know you already. Yes. Well, it's I, especially with our um, ah. Pretty yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, especially with our, our conversation of social media and teaching students to use social media, this is such an authentic and wonderful way to do it. So a lot of good practical ideas and a lot of possibilities. Yeah, and I I just did a webinar for iNACL earlier this week, and I asked them about that exact question, Lee. I said, how many webinars have been on um, about social media and how to integrate it into online learning? And blended learning, and they hadn't done one this year. My goodness! So it was a great opportunity for me to say, "Well, maybe you want to consider that," <laughs> because I think I confused a lot of people talking about what I was doing. Um, because social media is a big part of it. So yeah, yes, yeah. yeah, so but it's they're still blocking it. So yeah, and yeah. and thinking about why or not. Um, but it's the idea of expanding that walled garden and how long do you want to expand it for if they're already doing it. Um, and they're already doing things like that video I talked about and other things. So, yes, yeah, popping into the public Google chat rooms. But yeah. Yes, yes, public Google <laughs> chat rooms are scary things. They're about as scary as Second Life. So. I would agree. <laughs> That's what happens. <laughs> The scariest thing, though, was the person just coming in and staring at us. But luckily, I, it was interesting because I'm with someone in Indiana, but I felt safe because he was yeah. there with me. Yeah. Almost as scary as Baltimore. Yes, it was pretty scary. That's right. We, we now we've classified Second Life. <laughs> <laughs> Open Google Hangout. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Thank you all. And uh, thank you, Verena. And, uh, I uh, appreciate everyone coming today and I appreciate everything you shared with us and, and I'm looking forward to our continuing to work together and, and talk. So it's just great to connect with you. Awesome. And everybody will have your email address and your Twitter handle. So very good. All right. Thank you all and have a great afternoon. Thanks, Lee. Thank you, Brina. Bye, Matthew. So how many people here are with the, your class, do you know? I think there were two or three. Three were here from the actual class. Um, Matthew, we're working together on uh, the Alaska Humanities Forum on a curriculum for, um, for it's called Take Wing, and it's actually a uh, bridging curriculum to help students in the villages who are very isolated prepare for um, secondary, post-secondary experiences. So, and then he is working with, um, I think, Francis who came in and he's building the interface for this, uh, that will deliver the curriculum through. But he's been inspired by some flat classroom, Mookie type um, high school things. So I think he's still with us. Hello, Matthew. Thank you.
Thank you for joining us, Jean. Thanks, John. You made it. Now I just I've been he's in Australia. He's is, we've been joking about this all week. <laughs> How do you pronounce his first name? It's John. I think he is John, isn't it? I don't. Oh, it's it's John. Okay. I called him Jean. I'm sorry. Well, he was joking in Google. And then I wondered how many people did I send that out to, you know, one of those. <laughs> so, yeah, but I think we only had two or three. We had Tiffany, Ryan. Um, yeah, that's, I was, I was talking about you. We had Tiffany, Ryan, um, and Barbara. Barbara's the one who lives on a boat. And oh, wow, it's the it in. in. Yeah. So we had those three that are, were in the class. Everybody else was external. Virgil is a faculty member um, at the university, and he joined us. And so, yeah, we had a nice showing today. Very good. Great. Well, I'd love to talk to you more about what you and Matthew are doing because I am—I didn't get into all the First Nations stuff, but a lot of what I'm.